Hello everyone, this is Dave Vellante. We're diving into the deep end with AMD and Oracle on the topic of MySQL Heatwave performance. And we want to explore the important issues around machine learning. As applications become more data intensive and machine intelligence continues to evolve, workloads increasingly are seeing a major shift where data and AI are being infused into applications. And having a database that simplifies the convergence of transaction and analytics data without the need to context switch and move data out of and into different data stores and eliminating the need to perform extensive ETL operations is becoming an industry trend that customers are demanding. At the same time, workloads are becoming more automated and intelligent and to explore these issues further, we're happy to have back on theCUBE, Nipan Agarwal, who's the Senior Vice President of MySQL Heatwave, and Kumaran Siva, who's the Corporate Vice President of Strategic Business Development at AMD. Gents, hello again, welcome back. Hello, hi Dave. Thank you, Dave. Okay, Nipan, obviously machine learning has become a must have for analytics offerings. It's integrated into MySQL Heatwave. Why did you take this approach and not the specialized database approach as many competitors do, right tool for the right job. Right. So there are a lot of customers of MySQL who have the need to run machine learning on the data which is stored in MySQL database. So in the past, customers would need to extract the data out of MySQL and they would take it to a specialized uh, service for running machine learning. Now, the reason we decided to incorporate machine learning inside the database, there are multiple reasons. One, customers don't need to move the data. And if they don't need to move the data, it is more secure because it's protected by uh, the same access control mechanisms as the rest of the data. There is no need for customers to manage multiple services. But in addition to that, when we run the machine learning inside the database, customers are able to leverage the same service, the same hardware which has been provisioned for OLTP analytics and use machine learning capabilities at no additional charge. So from a customer's perspective, they get the benefits that it is a single database, they don't need to manage, uh, multiple services, and it is offered at no additional charge. And then as uh, uh, another aspect, which is kind of orthogonal, which is based on the IP, the work we have done, it is also significantly faster than what customers would get by having a separate service. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on that, how, how are you seeing customers use uh, Heatwave's machine learning capabilities today? How is that evolving? Right, so one of the things which you know customers very often want to do is to train their models based on the data. Now, one of the things is that uh, data in a database or in a transaction database changes quite, uh, uh, quite rapidly. So we have introduced support for auto machine learning as a part of Heatwave ML. And what it does is that it fully automates the process of training. And this is something which is very important to database users, very important to MySQL users, that they don't really want to hire a data scientist or a specialist for doing training. So that's the first part, that training in Heatwave ML is fully automated, doesn't require the user to provide any like specific parameters, just the source data and the task on which they want to train. The second aspect is that training is really fast. So the training is really fast. The benefit is that customers can retrain quite often. They can make sure that the model is up to date with any changes which have been made to their trans transaction database. And as a result of the models being up to date, the accuracy of the prediction is high, right? So that's the first aspect, which is training. The second aspect is inference, which customers um, run once they have the models trained. And the third thing, which has perhaps been the most um, sought after request from uh, the MySQL customers is the ability to provide explanations. So Heatwave ML provides explanations for any model which has been generated or trained by Heatwave ML. So these are the three capabilities, training, inference, and explanations. And this whole process is completely automated, doesn't require a, a specialist or a data scientist. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, training obviously very popular today. I've said inference I think is going to explode in the coming decade. Mm -hmm. And then of course, AI, explainable AI is a, is a very important issue. Kumran, what are the relevant capabilities of the AMD chips that are used in OCI to support uh, Heatwave ML, are they different from say the specs for Heatwave in general? So, so the, the, actually they aren't. And this is one of the, one of the key, um, key features of, uh, of this architecture that, that uh, or this implementation that is, that is r really exciting. Um, there, I, uh, with Heatwave ML, you're using the same CPU. And by the way, it's not a GPU, it's a CPU 
uh, for both uh, for all three of the functions that that Nippon just talked about, uh, inference, training, and explanation, all done on CPU. Um, you know, bigger picture, uh, how, well, the capabilities we bring here, we're really providing a balance. Um, you know, between the CPU cores, memory, um, and uh, and the networking, and what that allows you to do here is. Uh, be able to feed the CPU cores appropriately. And within the cores, we have uh, these, uh, a, you know, we have AVX uh, instruction extensions uh, in, with the um, with the Zen 2 and Zen 3 uh, cores. We had uh, AVX 2 and then with the Zen 4 core coming out, we're going to have uh, AVX 512. Um, but we were able to, with that balance of being able to bring in the data um, and utilize the high memory bandwidth and then use the computation to its maximum, we're able to provide uh, you know, build pride in, in enough uh, AI processing that we're able to get the job done. And then we're able to build a fit into that larger um, pipeline that, that we build out here for, uh, with, uh, with the heat wave. Got it. Uh, Nippon, you know, <laughs> you and I, every time we have a conversation, we got to talk benchmarks. So you've done <laughs> machine learning benchmarks with heat wave. You might even be the first in the industry to publish, you know, transparent open ML benchmarks on GitHub. I mean, I, I wouldn't know for sure, but I, I've not seen that as common. Can you describe the benchmarks and the data sets that you used here? Sure. So um, what we did was we took a bunch of open data sets for two categories of tasks, classification and regression. So we took about a dozen uh, data sets for classification and about six for regression. So to give an example, the kind of data sets we use for classification is like the airlines data set, HEGS, census, bank, right? So these are open data sets. And what we did was for on these data sets, we did a comparison of what would it take to train using HeatWave ML. And then the other service we compared with is Redshift ML. So there were two observations. One is that with HeatWave ML, the user does not need to provide any tuning parameters, right? The heat wave ML using RML fully generates a trained model, figures out what are the right algorithms, what are the right features, what are the right hyperparameters and such, right? So no need for any manual intervention. Not so the case with Redshift ML. The second thing is the performance, right? So the performance of um, heat wave ML uh, aggregate uh, on these 12 data sets uh, for classification and the six data sets on regression on an average, it is 25 times faster than Redshift ML. And note that Redshift ML in turn invokes SageMaker, right? So on an average, uh, HeatWave ML provides 25 times better performance uh, for training. And the other point to note is that there is no uh, need for any human intervention. It's fully automated. But in the case of Redshift ML, many of these data sets did not even complete in the set duration. If you look at price performance, one of the things, again, I want to highlight is because of the fact that AMD does pretty well in all kinds of workloads, we are able to use the same cluster, users can use the same cluster for analytics, for OLTP, or for machine learning. So there is no additional cost for customers to run um, uh, HeatWave ML if they have provisioned HeatWave. But assuming a user is provisioning a HeatWave cluster only to run HeatWave ML, right? that's the case. Even in that case, the price performance advantage of HeatWave ML over Redshift ML is 97 times, right? So 25 times faster at 1% of the cost compared to Redshift ML. And all these scripts and all this information is available on GitHub for customers to try to modify and like see like what are the advantages they would get on their workloads. Every time I hear these numbers, I shake my head. I mean, they're just so overwhelming. Um, and so <laughs> we'll see uh, how, how the competition responds, when and if they respond. Uh, so, but thank you for sharing those results. And Kumran, can you elaborate mm -hmm. uh, on how the specs that you talked about earlier contribute to Heatwave ML's you know, benchmarks results? I'm particularly interested in scalability. You know, typically things degrade as you push the system harder. What are you seeing? No, I think I think it's good. Hey, look, uh, yeah, that, by those numbers just blow me blow, blow my head too. It's, that's that's crazy. That's crazy good performance. Um, so look, from from an AMD perspective, uh, we we have. Um, uh, really built an architecture. Like if you think about the chiplet architecture to begin with, it is fundamentally, you know, it's got a kind of scaling by design, 
right? And and one of the things that we've done here is been able to um, work with uh, with the Heatwave team and Heatwell ML team, and then been able to to within within the uh, CPU package itself be able to scale up to take very efficient use of all of the cores, and then of course work with them on on how you go between nodes so you can have these very large systems that can um, that that can uh, run ML very 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 efficiently. So it's 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 really you know. Building, building on the the the, the building blocks of, of the uh, the chiplet architecture and how scaling happens there. Yeah, so it's, you're saying it's near linear scaling, or essentially. Is that, so is I'll that, let the punk comment on that. Uh, yeah, is it, yeah. Also, like, so how how about uh, cl as cluster sizes grow? Uh, right. Nippen? What 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 happens there? So one of the design points for a heat wave is scale out architecture, right? So as you said, that as we uh, add more data set uh, or we increase the size of the data, or we add um, the number of nodes to the cluster, we want the performance to scale. So we show that we have near linear uh, scale factor or near linear scale, uh, scalability for SQL workloads. In the case of heat wave ML as well, as users add more nodes to the cluster, so with the size of the cluster, the performance of Heatwave ML improves. So I was giving you this example that Heatwave ML is 25 times faster compared to Redshift ML. Well, that was on a cluster size of two. If you increase the cluster size of Heatwave ML to a larger number, I think the number is 16, the performance advantage over Redshift ML increases from 25 times faster to 45 times faster. So what that means is that on a cluster size of 16 nodes, Heatwave ML is 45 times faster for training. These again, dozen data sets. So this shows that Heatwave ML scales better than the competition. So you're saying adding nodes offsets any management complexity that you would think of as getting in the way. Is that right? Right, so one is the um, management complexity and which is why by features like elasticity, customers can scale up or scale down you know, very easily. The second aspect is okay, what gives us this advantage right, of scalability or how are we able to scale? Now, the techniques which we use for heat wave ML scalability are a bit different from what we use for SQL processing. So in the case of heat wave ML, they really like you know, three, two trade-offs which we have to be careful about. One is the accuracy, right? because we want to provide better performance for machine learning without compromising on the accuracy. So accuracy would require uh, like more synchronization if you have multiple threads. But if you have too much of synchronization, that can slow down the degree of parallelism we get, right? So we have to strike a fine balance. So what we do is that in Heatwave ML, there are different phases of training, like algorithm selection, feature selection, hyperparameter training. Each of these phases is parallelized. And for instance, one of the ways techniques we use is that if you're trying to figure out what's the optimal hyperparameter to be used, we start up with the search space and then each of the VMs gets a part of the search space and then we synchronize only when needed, right? So these are some of the techniques which we have developed over the years. And they're actually papers filed, uh, research publications filed on this. And this is what we do to achieve good scalability. And what that results to the customer is that if they have uh, some amount of training uh, time and they want to make it better, they can just provision a larger cluster and they will get better performance. Got it, thank you. Uh, Kumar, when, when I think of machine learning, machine intelligence, AI, I think GPU, but you're not, using GPU, uh, uh, so how are you able to get this type of performance, uh, price performance without using GPUs? Yeah, definitely. So, so um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and you think about what is going on here and you consider the whole pipeline um, that that Nippon has just described in terms of how you get you know your your training your algorithms and using the uh, the MySQL um, um, pieces of it to get to the point where the the AI can be effective. Um, in that process, what what happens is uh, you have to have a lot of memory transactions, a lot of memory bandwidth comes into play, and then bringing all that data together feeding the um, the actual uh, complex that does the AI calculations, that in itself could be the bottleneck, right? And you can have multiple bottlenecks along the way. And I think what, what you see in the AMD architecture from Epic for this use case is the balance um, and the fact that you are able to do uh, the pre-processing, the, uh, pre the AI, and then the post-processing all kind of seamlessly together 
that has a huge value. And that goes back to what Nippon was saying about um, using the same infrastructure gets you the better TCO, but it also gets you um, gets you better performance. And that's because of the fact that you're bringing the data to the computation. So the computation in this case is not strictly the bottleneck. It's really about how you, you pull pull together uh, what you need and, 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 uh, to uh, to do the AI computation. Uh, and that that is um, that's probably a more you know it's a it's a common case. And so you know you're going to start I think believe start to see this um, especially for inference applications. But in this case, we're doing both inference uh, uh, explanation and training all all using the uh, the uh, the CPU and the same same um, uh, OCI uh, infrastructure. Interesting. Now, Nippon is the is the secret sauce for heatwave ML performance different than what we've discussed before you and I with with heatwave generally? Is there some you know additive engine additive that you're putting in? Right. Yes, uh, the secret sauce is indeed different, right? Just the way I was saying that for SQL processing, the reason we get very good performance and price performance is because we have come up uh, with new algorithms which help um, the SQL processing scale out. Mm -hmm. Similarly, for heatwave ML, we have come up with new um, IP, new like algorithms. One um, example is that we use meta-learned proxy models, right? That's the technique we use for automating the training process, right? So think of this meta-learn proxy models to be like, you know, using machine learning for machine learning training. And this is an IP which we developed. And again, we have published the results and the techniques, but uh, having such kind of like techniques is what gives us a better performance. Similarly, another thing which we use is adaptive sampling that uh, you can have a large data set, but we intelligently sample to figure out that how can we train on a small subset without compromising on the accuracy. So yes, there are many techniques which we have developed specifically for machine learning, which is what gives us the better performance, better price performance, and also better scalability. What about MySQL Autopilot? Is there anything that differs from, from Heatwave ML that is relevant? Uh, okay, interesting you should ask. So uh, MySQL Autopilot is, think of it to be an application using machine learning. So MySQL Autopilot uses machine learning to automate various aspects of the database service. So for instance, if you want to figure out that what's the right partitioning scheme to partition the data in memory, we use machine learning techniques to figure out that what's the, right, the best column based on the user's workload to partition the data in memory. Or given a workload, if you want to figure out what is the right cluster size to provision, that's something we use MySQL Autopilot for. And I want to highlight that we're not aware of any other database service which provides this level of machine learning based automation, which customers get with MySQL Autopilot. Mm, interesting. Okay, last question for both of you. What are you guys working on next? What, what can customers expect from this collaboration specifically in, in this space? Uh, maybe Nippon, you can start and then Kumaran can, can bring us home. Sure, so there are two things we are working on. One is based on the feedback we have gotten from customers, we're going to keep uh, making the machine learning capabilities richer in heatwave ML. That's one dimension. And the second thing is which Kumran was alluding to earlier, uh, we are looking at the next generation of like processes coming from AMD. And we will be seeing as to how we can more benefit from uh, these uh, processes, whether it's the um, size of the L3 cache, the memory bandwidth, the network bandwidth and such, or the uh, NUMA effects, and make sure that we leverage the, all the greatness which the new generation of process will, processes will offer. It's like an engineering playground, uh, Kumaran. Yeah. Let's uh, yeah. we'll give you the final word. No, that's great. Now, look, with the Zen 4 um, CPU cores, we're also bringing in um, AVX uh, 512 uh, instruction capability. Now, our implementation is a little different. It was in, in uh, Rome and Milan too, where we use a double pump implementation. What that means is, you know, we, we take two cycles to do, to, to do these instructions, but the key thing there is we don't lower our speed of the CPUs, so there's no noisy neighbor effects. Um, and it's something that OCI and uh, and um, uh, the, the heat wave has taken taken full advantage of. And so, like as we go out in time and we see the Zen four core, we can uh, we, we see up to 96, 96 CPUs. That that's going to work really well. So we're collaborating uh, closely with uh, uh, with OCI and with uh, with the heat wave team here to make sure that we can take advantage of that. And we're also going to upgrade the memory um, subsystem to get to 12 channels of DDR5. Um, so it should be, you know, there should be a fairly significant boost in um, in absolute performance, um, but more important, or just as importantly, in TCO value for uh, for the customers, the end customers who are going to uh, adopt this great service. 
I love their relentless innovation. Guys, thanks so much for your time. We're going to have to leave it there. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, thank Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, thank you for watching this special presentation on theCUBE, your leader in enterprise and emerging tech coverage.